what is up ladies and gentlemen of the internet my name is jade and we're back again it's episode 007 simon what do you think about that we've got a license a license to talk shit <laughs> james bond license to kill we have the license to talk nonsense on the internet <laughs> License to talk nonsense on the internet, and that means we've completed seven episodes of this quite interesting podcast, if I do say so myself. I've really enjoyed uh, the process of standing this up. I'm joined today by Simon, as I mentioned. Simon, how's your week been? Oh, it's been great. It's been pretty full on, but um, being able to get out there in, in the last couple of days and enjoy my weekend... Uh, do some wholesome outdoorsy activities, so can't complain. Pretty nice and cruisy Sunday afternoon. Ready to get online and uh, <laughs> and um, and get radical. That's really awesome. And Hannah, I I know pretty much everything you've been up to, but for the benefit of the people at home, how's your week been? Good. <laughs> yes, you know it seems to have been a really busy week, but um. No, it's good, and good to be back online, so thank you guys for having me. We have the question of the day coming right up, guys, but it's also worth a mention uh, that today is the last day of Mental Health Week here in New Zealand, so right after the question of the day, we are going to be uh, chatting a little bit about mental health, mental wellness, and our, our different experiences around that. If Anything we talk about during the next hour or so appeals to you. Uh, this is an interactive podcast, so feel free to leave comments in the chat. We would love to hear from you. Unlike most spaces on the internet as well, discourse is actually welcome. And with that, I'll move on to the question of the day. Simon, are you ready? Oh, mate, pumped. I've given Simon a little bit of a clue in terms of what's going to be coming up, but as usual, he did not want to see the question. Uh, but the question of the day today, guys, is... Have you ever used a childhood perspective to solve a complex problem as an adult? Have you ever used a childhood perspective to solve a complex problem as an adult. Simon, do you want to go or should I? Yeah, I feel like if you would, if you have something ready, uh, I think it's an amazing <laughs> question. It's a great question, but I want to give it a little bit of thought. So I'm sure. happy, happy to hear your answer first. Go ahead, mate. Yeah, so I, I think I've referred to this a couple of times on the show, but if I was to answer this question, it would be around... Uh, my parenting. So there there are things that, that I like about the way my parents parented. Uh, there are things that I absolutely do not like and what was committed uh, to making a change. So in terms of, I, I would consider parenting a complex problem or something to work through because there's no manual to parenting at all. So when I reflect on the kind of parent that I wanted to be, I reflected on how did I feel as a child? When my mum did blank, how did that make me feel? When my dad did blank, how did that make me feel? And I just reverse engineered the entire situation. I like it, I like it. So, so my example up front is definitely around the parenting. Yeah. Mm, mm. Um, Jay, do you have do you have the um, a, a different scene for the question of the day? Am I able to read it again, or do you have to bring? Oh, it I can bring it back. Oh yeah. We don't have, have a scene you... for this yet. I can get one made. Yeah. No, it's all right. <laughs> I was just wondering, have you ever used a childhood perspective to solve a complex problem as an adult? Hmm. Oh yeah, bring it back now. Okay. Bring me in. <laughs> I'm ready. Oh, I there's a, there's a, there's so many different ways I want to answer this, but I I don't know. Maybe this will be like the most entertaining way. 
Um, oh, how am I going to say this? As I was thinking of like uh, childhood behavior as um, as kind of uh, low level emotional responses, like um, uh, kind of instant instant reactive responses to to situations. Uh, and that's how most kids work. So I was trying to think, okay, so how have there been situations where like instant, instantly I've, um, I've reacted to a, what is a complex problem with a quick, simple, uh, emotional response. That's how I kind of interpreted the question. It's how all good, used... bro. It doesn't, yeah, have, yeah. it doesn't have to be my framing of the question either. Like it's yeah. all good. Yeah, no, but I mean, that's just how I think, it, that's how I read the question, but I think it's cool. Um, <laughs> like, oh, it's hard to think of a, a specific example. They keep kind of, they keep kind of floating in. Um, but like, with, with, oh, I guess it's with, um, um, with like, interactions with authority. That's where I wanted to go with it. Cool, um, Let, let's hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, not not just an interaction with authority. A person with perceived authority, based on the context of the situation you're in, and no other authority other than that. Um, and, uh, and and for them to be, um, uh, I guess, trying to dictate my behaviour or or um, for me to complete a task that they that is in their best interests and doesn't quite align with what would be best for me. But be, and um, the example I would give is like um, dealing with, um, with, with co-workers that, that are from not the same team. This is not the current work I'm in. This is from a, one of my previous jobs. A, a lady who had a perceived position of power in a different team and the only reason she ever thought she could um, be so authoritative in her in, in her uh, address, addressing me was because she believed she had power based on where we worked, and I had this like instant instant gut reaction to think, well, you're you're um, you're not after my best interests. You're after using me to further your own aims, and it was like it wasn't it wasn't like I thought through the situation properly or anything like that. It was just like this emotional response to the way they were talking to me. It just didn't feel right. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that as a kid from like teachers um, yeah. on the school, like in the school when a rule doesn't make sense and you have this really, this instinctual reaction to just be against that authoritarian pressure i mean I've, i'm using a bit of hyperbole to explain it but you know For when sure. somebody is yeah so when someone's totally trying to push something on you and it just doesn't sit right with you and you don't think through the problem methodically you just instinctually say no that's not right and i guess that's something that i use quite often um and it's a skill all right like people always think oh you know think things through but you should always trust your instinct and it's a skill that you practice just like your your muscles. I'll finish my answer to the question. Today with this. Just like you work out your muscles, mm. or you read books, you work on your intuition. You listen to when your body or your or your something makes a decision for you, and you feel it. And and the more times you follow that, the better you get at listening to it and and um, and, and and pursuing what is is right for you. Um, just before you go, Hannah, I want to respond and say. You, you know, let's face it, for the, for the first five years of our life at least, depending on the month you're born, um, your only guidance to understand the world is your parents. And, and you know, even from a very young age, they're, they're, like, they're not teaching you right from wrong, that would be wrong to say, but they're certainly teaching you what kindness is. You learn kindness from your parents and, you, you know, the way they embrace you, the way they care for you, the way they set reasonable boundaries and protect you, that, that that's where you form that gut feeling from, Simon. And um, mm. 
But even if you've got bad parents, like there might be some people in the chat would say, well, my parents didn't protect me. Yeah, I, I know that can be a thing as well. Regardless of that though, your shaping of that gut feeling happens within that first five years. So I totally, wow. totally get that. Hmm. So I've kind of got two answers here. Go ahead. One, um, <laughs> I see, is, is not quite answering your question, but it is. So as a child, I, I always remember from the beginning, you know, you have Play-Doh and you have to, and it's all about creativity and the perception of creating something. So I think, as an adult, I've just learned that no matter what you're doing in life, every part, every every kind of job, every kind of part of your day, you need creativity. So I recognize. Well, as a that's child, deep. <laughs> you know, you just have to develop that and grow and. Even if you think it's it's pretty straightforward and pretty a pretty serious moment, you need that creativity. And then my other thought was actually, as a child, you know, you're all about thinking that. I remember saying as a child, "Duh, don't you know that?" Or why is she saying that? So my big thing was resilience and my thing around resilience was really not giving up and not questioning it and I see that, um, this is taking me back a wee bit, but I really look at resilience when it came to my health problems and when I first got um, started losing my eyesight and I had to really dig deep into when I was younger and think right so how can we navigate this and this isn't gonna stop this isn't gonna stop me you're gonna do more in life and then from there it's about experiencing and learning from others I, I've got a I've got a particularly morbid response to resilience because I, I spend a lot of time in spaces where uh resilience is often talked about you know you know the disability community i, th I think they're frankly drunk on resilience but before we head into the mental health segment i wonder simon if you could run back the question of the day uh for the people at home for us yeah sure so the question of the day is have you ever used a childhood perspective to solve a complex problem as an adult? And we all shared some unique perspectives and takes on the question. So um, if you are in the chat, then let us know uh, when have you used a childhood perspective to take on a problem that probably required a little bit extra thought and consideration than you gave it maybe. All right. Now, just reflecting on the fact that it is the last day of mental health week I, I thought it would be cool for the team to take a moment um to do something a little bit different so often what you see on television programs and uh different online shows is people immediately jump to the how how are you well like what do you do to be well or how do you stay well or what are your tips around wellness <laughs> Anarchist in the chat says, I really didn't have a good childhood, so can't answer that. Kind of well, Yep. I was just going to say, Anarchist, it doesn't mean you had to deal with the problem good. I mean, if there's an interesting story you want to tell about a, a complex problem that you handled childishly, that you thought this might be sharing, then uh, you're welcome to. He said, mental health-wise, I just deal with it. Yeah. Um, it's what worked a, for many, many a blokes over the years. The um, just deal with it, she'll be right attitude. Exactly. And one of the things I wanted to do in this segment is rather than do the usual tropes of wellness and hooray, this is, a, this is how mentally stable I am, 
I wondered if we could go to a place, Simon, of just sharing uh, times that, that we're, we have been challenged in terms of our mental health, whether that be mood-wise or any other aspects um, that we want to share. Because, because I'm making such a request, I was very pr prepared to go first. And one of the one of the things that I would share is, um, you know, I I've said out many times on this show that I work in the social services sector here in New Zealand. Very fortunate uh, to be able to do that. And one of the things that I reflected on before the show was the fact that it's difficult to see the fruits of my labour in the space that I'm in. Simon knows well that I've been working on a particular piece of policy work for almost a decade. And it's very difficult for anyone to see, not just me, exactly what the fruits are going to be. So, so I'm always having to so, sort of look to the horizon. And some, sometimes it can be really hard. I have days where, where I sort of go, well, I know I'm working hard, I know I'm putting a lot of hours in, I'm making a lot of personal sacrifice uh, for the work that I do, but I don't see the fruits. So that can be somewhat challenging, and, and that's what I wanted to share today. Mm. That awesome. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Jade. And, man, I can totally relate to that <laughs> after only being like involved in the sector for uh, a few years i can really i i've definitely not had the same amount of responsibility that you've had with this mm. policy but mm. in my roles just the yeah the the <laughs> amount of effort that you just um you put in and um it's not it's not a well publicized area of um no. of of um professional um success you know it's not like it's going to get inside um, New Zealand, uh, what do you, some sort of New Zealand business magazine uh, <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, you're not going to get on on many TV shows, um, but uh, but it's definitely meaningful. Mahi, um, something that I wanted to to, to share um, is about <clears throat> overall. The overall part is really about um, uh, being able to being able to to uh, trust that I, I, um, I knew what was best for myself. I, um, like I, I finished high school, went into university, got a degree. And while I was working, while I was, um, finishing my degree was at an intern, had an internship at, at, at a tech company, um, which then hired me full time after I um, finished uh, university. And that's a pretty well trodden path for many people. And I thought, yeah, this is cool. This, you know, this is what, it, this is what most people my age are supposed to do. You're supposed to graduate, do well, um, get the skills to get a job and then work your way up from there. And I just, I saw myself to basically starting from scratch again, you know, once you once you finish university, you feel like you've you've reached a level of achievement, and then you basically just have to throw it all out the window because businesses don't <laughs> work like universities. Your job isn't like handing in assignments. Your colleagues aren't like other students. They are adults with kids and responsibilities, and they're fucking assholes to you at the drop of a hat because. They don't have to be nice to you um, if they don't want to, and they are all out for themselves. Everybody in the corporate business world is out for themselves, and it was just this um, massive shock to my system as somebody who's quite an empathetic and caring man. I was just so jaded and so nihilistic about everything. I was having fake conversations with my colleagues. You know, they were... They were coming in and you know asking about your weekend and how your day was and it was just you know just auto for pilot responses and I just wasn't enjoying it at all. Was self medicating at home you know to try and just uh, you know caffeinating to to stimulate myself through the day and medicating to fall asleep at night and 
it just got to the point where I ended up just having a full on pretty much breakdown at work. Left, got my, I didn't like what well, I was just, I could had, I was, I had this massive wave of just stress tighten up through my whole body, feel my hands get clammy, feel my heartbeat race and, and I just felt like I was going to explode of a mixture of like anger and sadness and just complete confusion about what I was doing and why I was sitting there at this computer. Walked off into the stairwell and basic into like the, the fire stairwell and basically just broke down completely. Only thing I could think of was to like call my mum and I could all I could get out the phone was just like panic breaths and she basically brought me down into the calm state. And um, that was pretty much the, the turning point. Started seeing somebody talking about some of those issues. Um, my mum took me to the GP to see about getting medication. But, uh, you know, I talked about being unhappy and, and the doctor wanted to prescribe me some serious um, SSRIs to take. And, you know, those things you have to wean yourself on and off. And most people never, ever come off them or come off them and... Um, break down even harder so I didn't want to take medication if I didn't have to um, and managed to, to take other other measures in my life like changing my my work um, was a massive part in it and, and um, doing a lot of things uh, to the physical body that I could do like diet and all that other stuff like mm. the basic stuff that people think is nonsense that all, all that stuff helped and I'm and it got me to a point where I could, yeah, I could manage through life and also talk to somebody about um, the bigger things that you kind of just leave behind in your past um, as you grow up. Well, but, what, yeah, a, I mean, what an incredible story, Simon. So you had this idea of, like, what people do at your age. You actually achieved the goal you thought you wanted. And then you found an environment that was completely toxic. So so internally, you're just like, what do I do now? Like, everything I thought I wanted, I actually don't. I think that's a feeling that a lot of people would relate to, man. Myself included, I've definitely had moments like that. And, you know, I won't go too much into it now, but I'm navigating spaces like that currently you know mm. so thank you for thank you for raising that story man no, no. i'm happy to share it because i mean it doesn't doesn't make me weak or anything like that you know no. it's just, i wouldn't be wouldn't be sitting here right now if i hadn't gone through the, the the challenges that i have and i just noticed that anarchist has had a couple comments come through while i was sharing my story too. yeah yeah Let, let's run it back on anarchist comments if i can get my um mouse wheel to work Um, closest thing to that I can say is I'm a survivor and a fighter, so no matter the challenge, whether I feel defeated or not, I keep pushing and find a way to solve it. People say that being angry all the time is unhealthy, but anger has been a force that has driven me. Uh... Yeah, very interesting, and and he's just acknowledging uh, your contribution, what you shared. So, I mean, re really amazing story, really amazing. Yeah. And anarchist, you're not wrong about anger being a great motivational tool, but it's not a permanent one because it relies on you being in a non-sustainable state of mind. The human being and human nature, we are not meant to be angry beings there they say there are two primal emotions that all our all other human expression stems from and that's fear and love <clears throat> and anger is the result of fear and love is an energy that can be is just as powerful on its own um and it's it's not and it's so sounds so corny for somebody who may not be emotionally stable enough to accept it but it is the truth. Eventually, anger is going to burn you out and you've got to move into a position where you are doing actions out of love for yourself or love for others. 
um, and it's something that you have to work at because it's very hard to fall out of love with people who don't meet your expectations or follow um, the path that you want. Even yourself, you know, it's very hard. If, you, if you're not meeting your own expectations, it's hard to love yourself. But um, don't rely on anger to be that motivator. It's got to it's switch over at some point. Hannah, did you have anything you wanted to share around mental health? Yeah. Um, now, I don't kind of have a specific situation, but um, a period that I see that I see that I started doubting myself and starting fear, fearing and the increase and getting anxious for what could could go wrong and also not feeling like I was in, in control recognizing that other people's had other people have their own thoughts and I don't have control over what other people say or do exactly so I then got started doubting myself and started fearing because I tried to plan what what I was trying to do in my work and then it was completely against what actually my boss wanted or what was expected in life and then I started doubting in in life you know what was going on and I started getting questioning and fearing what was going around and exactly what Simon said you know fear you know, anger's not the way to go. From fear, I started getting ang angry, I started questioning, and then from that, I started questioning the way to move forward. So I see that I've just had to learn tips and tricks to actually recognize that, hey, you're not in control of other people's thoughts and feelings, and you just need to stop, think, and you're in control of yourself, and you can't think too far ahead but they own who you are mm. Mm. oh just come being to the a, sorry something you go i was just gonna say being a people pleaser or you know being yeah. a hell being held captive to uh, other people's emotions is something we've talked about a lot here and something i've struggled with a little bit myself oh, a lot probably in the past and um yeah it's 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 hard because we're humans we want to care and we and I, there's a good tweet somebody said the key is to care about other people but not what they think <laughs> i like that and uh the the bit that i was going to add before we go to the chat again is that um one of the things i i do for myself so this is certainly not like when we're, we're not offering professional mental health advice at all here but one of the things that I do for myself is I've stopped allowing myself to to actually process thoughts, Simon. So that that sounds really weird. It's like, how do you do anything during the day? Well, actually, thoughts are different to ideas. Thoughts are those little voices that go around in your head telling you, Oh, you're too tired, you do this, you do that. It's not a good idea, we shouldn't do that. It's cloudy outside. Thoughts in my mind are those thoughts that are on autopilot based on usually negative experiences that I've had in my life. So I, mm -hmm. I don't allow myself to process those at all. Ideas, I have millions of those and I choose the ones I want and we go for those but thoughts about myself and my surroundings I don't process it all yeah there's a um there's this line in an Alan Watts uh like uh, talk a recorded talk and the start it's called the, the overthinker and um and it's like yeah uh, and it's, it was like a man who only has thoughts um loses himself in thought and he's like by by, by thought he says chatter of the skull <laughs> and i think that's like a, that's such a good way to describe it and lines up with what you're trying to say like you you just you just stop your brain from chattering yeah you know it's, it's that um you can yeah and that's the practice of meditation so what you're really doing there jade is just your active meditation 
you're doing a task or <laughs> you're not just completely sitting perfectly still, but you're, you're not allowing your stream of consciousness to be interrupted by thought, which is meditation. Um, Jay, there's some pretty interesting comments. Yeah, you want to read some off? I was going to say, yeah, yeah. So he, um, yeah, he, um, Annika says, oh, I agree. Just anger is all I know. And I just, I was about to type it in the chat, but realize I'm not signed in. But um, I totally feel that sentiment, but I don't believe that that's a forever thing. I mean, everybody ha will eventually find um, ways to, to feel all the emotions that we're yeah. offered as humans. Um and then he says, and by anger, I'm not referring to full out anger or rage. More, I have a baseline of mild anger at all times. And yes, I use as a driving force. Um, and then the next one's a little bit more interesting. This one's for you, Jade. And he says, and I haven't filled Jade Farah in on this, but now is a perfect time to announce I found my dad. Oh, that, wow. That is amazing news. We'd love to hear a bit more about the background on that one uh Anikis, i hope that's good news for you i hope mm. the experience with connecting with him was positive and we'd love to hear about it in the chat jade i wonder if we capitalize on the moment of talking about overthinkers and share in a would you get um do you, would you get in trouble if you played a song from youtube or is would that um get get the stream in trouble um we we you know what we can do we can we can play it on stream and the way i've got the recording set up is it won't be in there so i can just mm. do a little bit of editing for youtube later you got a song in mind well it's just it's called <laughs> overthink it and it and it's a bit of an it's a bit of a, a a banger with a lot of um a lot of emotions attached to it for me but um I'm shall i send it is Facebook the best way to get it to you, or Discord? Ah, uh, Facebook right at the moment, yeah, because I'm yes. jammed in on the cameras, yep. Yeah, no worries. Um, but it's it's called The Overthinker, and it's beautiful, because it's it's this electronic song with um, an Alan Watts uh, talk laid over top, and it's, um, you know, the, all we need to do is listen to the build-up, and then the first drop, and it's just an experience all on its own. Um, and it's only a couple minutes and I feel like it might be worth it. I will make that happen. Just there's a few clicks um, that I need to do. So if you could just fill some space for me, Simon, that'd be really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No yeah. Um, so if you haven't h heard of Alan Watts before, well, you should definitely do some reading on him. Jade, do you know who Alan Watts is? He is a philosopher, but I don't have much more than that, I'm afraid. Yeah, so he's a, a Western. He's a Western man that had a very big um, passion for Eastern philo philosophy. So loved the Buddhists and the Tao, and especially the Tao, which is translate to the Way, basically. And um, and uh, he based a lot of his work off researching an older philosopher called be called uh, called Lao Tzu or you know I'm definitely butchering the name how it's said properly but that's how you would say as a foreigner if you're saying it how it's spelled Lao Tzu and um, he has all these beautiful teachings um, and there's lots of these recorded talks and there's a whole genre of EDM of these beautiful talks about meditation and self-actualization and, and under, understanding the true nature of humans with these really beautiful melodic electronic songs underneath and it's it's really i think it's a really cool blend of a genre which is considered really shallow in that and it's bright lights lasers funny noises and um it's supposed to just tingle your senses mixed with this guy who's got a really gentle brilliant way of speaking and it's really profound in what he talks about so i think it's you know when you have these opposing forces come together it's a be it's a beautiful pro uh, project. So um, I I just have to play this. They can't hear it at home, but there's an ad at the front, unfortunately, Sam. No worries. And yeah, I I could have done it on Spotify. Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I spot I think I Spotify. Um, should we do the song now, or do you want to go to the chat first? I haven't seen what's new in the chat. Um, uh, so I took an Ancestry 
DNA test, and mm. one of my closest relatives was a Davis. And after reaching out to a, a Facebook organization, I hope you meant Facebook, and with two months of searching, I found out who he was, and there were a few funny things about it. Oh, wow. Wow. That is epic. That's hard case, yeah. Oh, well, I hope I hope um, it was a positive thing to reconnect with your father. Sometimes it's not always positive, but, yeah, I mean, just so just anyone's joined in since we were talking about overthinking, I just wanted to share this song with me because it's got a really dear place in my heart, um, and I think just the first part of the song, through, through the build-up and into the chorus, is just like an experience where you can just kind of sit back, listen to what he says, enjoy the music, and just, if you feel like closing your eyes, do so, but it's a great, it's a great time. All right, I got that for you right now. I can't hear anything. Thanks so much for that, Simon. Um, I've never heard want. that, so I've got the link now, and I can listen to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's great. The chat is busy today. It's great. The the saga of Anika's dad. He knew about me, but didn't didn't know if what if my bi biological was telling the truth. Mother, biological mum. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, he was where I grew up partially as a kid, and before I moved to West Virginia, he was like ten to fifteen minutes from me, and I never knew. I haven't met him in person, but I keep in contact and have spoken, have spoke with him on the phone. Wow. Wow. That's Absolutely cool. amazing. That is... I'd like... Sorry. Oh, I was just to say, that is, that is crazy. I was just about to say, Jade, before I cut you off, I'd like to share a, a story about somebody I know that, that grew up with um, their father living close to them. Um... Go ahead. Yeah, it's just it, it kind of kind of loops back to what you were talking about <laughs> with um, reverse engineering your parenting, the parenting that you experienced from your from your parents. Um, this guy grew up um, ten to fifteen minutes from his father. His father knew where he was. He knew where his father was, but his father wanted nothing to do with this kid. Wow. So yeah. his, his whole life, he grew up being in the same neighborhood, seeing him around the place sometimes, apparently, and just nothing didn't want a thing to do with him and the most interesting way this this manifested in this guy as an adult was at a party i had at my house this dude was wasted he was hitting on a dude's girlfriend the dude was um, a properly trained fighter so came in assertively didn't touch the guy physically but told him to back the f up and don't talk to his girlfriend and to leave him alone um and this guy just didn't get the message and was just, I guess he was just too drunk for it to settle in. But it got to the point where um, this guy was like, just stop talking to me. He's like, just don't talk to me. I don't want to hear about it. Just leave us all alone. Leave me alone. And this guy's like, oh, oh, oh bro, just, 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 I want to shake your hand. Let's just put it behind us and just shake my hand. And this guy was like, I don't care, bro. Just forget about it. But I'm not shaking your hand. I want nothing to do with you. And this guy's like, oh, shake my hand. Why do you want to shake my hand? And then he started getting aggressive about this guy not wanting to, you know, physically engage. acknowledge him and engage with him. And it was because, and I didn't, and I, this whole thing was going on. I thought it was so bizarre until one of my friends who knew the guy, he's like, yeah, bro, like, this is the story. You know, he grew up with his father nearby, didn't want anything to do with him. And then you hear that, and it's so obvious. This guy experience this person who's so key to his life wanting nothing to do with them that he's obviously reverse engineered that to i should never let anybody feel small and not acknowledge them and to always make it right you know i should always make things right with somebody because that person in my life never did that for me and, I, and i just yeah it was sorry an to spoil the experience. moment simon mm. but i've lost my camera Oh, yes, you have frozen. I thought you were just and listening actually, quite intently. Actually, we might have lost the whole stream. The whole thing is frozen. Oh, God. 
I'm gonna hang in there and let the twirly wheel twirl. I'm not gonna. Okay, we we good. You good? I'm just gonna switch to my backup camera as I did last week. Um, where are you gone? I'm still here. Yeah, Anakis so, has just said I can hear you. Sorry, <laughs> but, sorry, folks. This has been an ongoing issue. We'll we'll get it sorted by the next episode. I was hoping I resolved it. Simon, incredible mm. story. Um, I, I feel dreadful about interrupting. That is all good. I mean, I it came to an end there anyway. But it's just uh, I, it, just to go on. <coughs> you know, Anakis saying that it's quite a funny thing that he grew up ten to fifteen minutes from his father. Um, and, you know, never knowing about him and how that may have influenced his life versus somebody who knew their father in the same situation and knew that person was there and how that's, um, that's influenced the situations they find themselves in. So, um, so, so yeah, the yes, moral of the story is the things, things that we experience as kids stay with us and, and impact us more than we are aware of. I mean, yes, he was drunk. Yes, he was doing something incredibly inappropriate. Um, approaching uh, another man's woman, if you can even say that online. Um, but, yeah, you know, like you said, it really unearthed earth some deep, dark issues for the guy. So, yeah, I, I wish him all the best with that. You know, I hope he has the opportunity to get some professional help and when i say professional help i'm not meaning hospital you know you know just taking the opportunity to talk to a professional about it is not a bad thing as simon said earlier don't get me started on how unhealthy hospitals are <laughs> like if, if you ever stop to think about the way hospitals are designed and every single aspect of them is to make you unhealthy in ca oh, it's all LED or fluorescent light bulbs, which are bad for your skin. It's all white, pale walls, no no life in any of the spaces. It's all heavily air conditioned and, and sterile. I guess sterile mm. for a reason. But the, a hospital is not a place to go to get better. You know what I mean? Like, they fix you, but you should not stay in a hospital. Those things are not designed to be a healthy, recovery-friendly environment. Pro probably, probably a conversation for another podcast. Well, we'll get to the news in just a moment, but I, I will just say that um, when I had my hip replacement, it was actually a big deal because I'd actually grinded my hip joint away. I had, I had put up with um, hip pain for so long that I actually didn't have an existing hip joint anymore because it was grinding up against my socket. It had wow. been dislocated. Um, so I knew this was going to be a big surgery and they ordered ordered parts from France because we, we don't keep the, the part that would suit me in New Zealand and all this stuff and... And um, they wanted to send me off to rehab pretty quickly, didn't they, Hannah? And I said, I don't care what anyone says, I'm not going to rehab because it's actually going to make my rehab last longer, if you know what I mean. The, mm. the sooner I'm back in my own environment, I can learn the skills that I need to, to manage myself again. You send me to a rehab situation... It's going to be foreign environments where, where nothing's like it is at home. And it's just going to take me longer to get better. So, Simon, I totally relate to that. So, it, um, we, yeah, we haven't even got to the news yet. <laughs> <laughs> we started talking about mental health and just um, got sidetracked by Anarchist <laughs> finding his father. It's cool. Speaking of news, mm, though, that that, that's epic news. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I, I found that with severe issues, you go to rehab and your pain is worse. Exactly. And that's exactly how it would have been for me. But anyway, so did you, 
Did you want to drop one of yours first, or should I go? Yeah, you go, mate. Okay. So, what I want to be talking about today... Well, we'll go back up to the headline, and I'll switch the scene. So, if you're, if you're new to the channel, the, the goal with this stuff is not for us to read articles to you. Some channels do that, and they do it quite artfully, but uh, that's not our goal. We'll provide all the links to stories that we have for you in the description of the YouTube uh, video after this. But, um, Simon, this month, Xbox is celebrating accessibility with the disability community. Now, oh. a, a little bit before I get into the facts, um, this this article in particular hit different for me. So, it all started kind of happening around PlayStation 1, where the first version of the controller really came out. It was the first controller that wasn't all the buttons on the front face right like you remember the sega how all the buttons yep. were just on the front and you could deal with them like that and there was only one d-pad and there was no such thing as 3d sort of motion there were no dual shock sticks or anything like that i was excited for the playstation one because I thought, you know, new technology, HD quality, you know, they were talking about 480p being this new thing. But <laughs> I, I suddenly realized that for a lot of games, I was going to have issues playing with them. Um, you, you know, it, it hit different for me when I put in Wipeout for the first time. And I realized you had to use the shoulder buttons in order to be able to break. Mm. And Wipeout was one of the first games where I realized, holy shit, this is going to be a real problem. And of course, um, back in the day, controller mapping was not a thing. Mm. So as a disabled person, you were able either able to play the game or you won't so so can i just shout out to wipe out really quick just before you continue because please. i i love that game and i don't know many people that would actually remember that i mean there's probably a lot of people the large majority of the twitch audience were not alive when Wipeout was a thing <laughs> no and it was a great game you make a decent point there and um Thank you for showing my age, Simon, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but that's just sort of setting the scene in terms of, like, why this matters, because I'm sure, I'm sure people hear about accessibility all the time, but it doesn't really connect with them because it doesn't affect them. So that's just a personal anecdote. Um, so Xbox recently held an online event. Um, some of the things they covered, there were so many, I actually had to make a list on my phone. Um, what, one thing that Microsoft are going to start to do uh, on their store, for, for their Xbox store, is make metadata available so that people know uh, before buying the game whether certain accessibility features are available. Now, when I say accessibility features... Things like captions, uh, the ability to map the controller, is that available in the game? Is, is the ability to invert up and down available in the game? That's really important to the disability community. Um, also adjusting color tones. So for people that might be uh, colorblind, if you're not able to have full control over the c color tones, it can actually make parts of the game unseeable. Uh, video games are also starting to implement dyslexia fonts, and they're also looking at um, 
narration for the menu options. Now, this is not just for visually impaired people. Some people with dyslexia process information much faster and e easier via audio. So, so it's not just for the blind that, that it's going to be useful. Uh, Xbox also announced that, that they have now set up game accessibility standards. So for developers that are wanting to be at the peak of gaming accessibility, uh, there's now a document that developers can download and go through to implement you know top end accessibility for their games going forward uh this is not a new thing this is actually something uh simon brought to my attention a couple of years ago but xbox wanted to re-highlight i suppose the xbox accessibility controller now this is a weird piece of tech it, it kind of looks like a notebook but you actually have the ability to plug all sorts of different buttons and switches into it to be able to customize uh, your controller experience physically. So it was really good to see that um, reprofiled and, and stuff like that because I think people have forgotten about it. Um, they also mentioned Copilot. Now I've got a clip about Copilot that I'm going to play in a second. Um, but one of the things I wanted to raise, maybe for a bit of discussion, Simon, is that um, micro Microsoft are now implementing HR processes that are neurodiverse responsive, held entirely within Minecraft. Wait, eight, what do you mean HR yeah, response? <laughs> Can you no, no, no. HR processes that are neurodiverse responsive. Yeah, what's the HR process? So, in terms of hiring neurodiverse people. Oh, and Minecraft. Oh, they're, right. They're yeah. holding oh. interview processes and, and task based challenges inside Minecraft for, for the neurodiverse. Oh, ha, ha. Oh, right. That's crazy. It, I was like, I couldn't quite <laughs> figure out what you mean. That is, yeah, that is no, awesome. I, I couldn't either. I was like, eight shows. Sorry, I could, have done, I could have done better writing my line nah, for that. but I, I, I do have uh, one discussion point, if you wouldn't mind letting me entertain the idea. Fine. Um, I, while you were reading out the article, I was thinking, oh, man, you know, it probably makes so much sense for them to, to – implement these accessibility features because if you think about it in terms of <coughs> dollar invested to dollar returned um you're making yourself and your product available to such a bigger market that um and that it, it makes easy sense like if you're looking for the best roi um there's nothing much better than accessibility improving accessibility is always going to lead to roi and then of course because i can't help it and i'm a huge cynic I just thought, huh, what if they've just reached like that saturation point in their market for, for gamers that they thought, oh, what's a market that um, hasn't quite been accessed yet that we can we can benefit off? And so <laughs> the cynic in me thinks, oh, they probably just got to the point where they finally thought, oh, well, let's just go after the disabled market and uh, make some money off them. But it seems like, I mean, that's the cynical version and... The, the controller that I shared with Jade, you know, a few years ago, and I'm hoping that they've improved on it. I mean, it's definitely um, good, valuable accessibility tools for people who have physical impairments that make controller use tough. Like the 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 vast r array of different buttons and mm. wheels and switches. toggles and switches <laughs> that you can use instead of any other button is um, it's pretty cool. And PlayStation, I don't think, has done anything like that. So, so I think, in, and you'll have the ability, because we're going to include the link, just to review the entire event, but I was just blown away by Xbox's commitment uh, to make gaming accessible. Like you just said, there might be an untapped market, or, or at least a market that feels shunned right, right back to the PlayStation 1, which is certainly... Mm -hmm. um, my experience but um just to cap this off 
I, w I want to share a clip. This this clip that we're about to share uh, is a video that just highlights, you know, the real impact of making gaming accessible and profiling in particular. One uh, feature that they're calling Copilot, which enables you to merge two controllers into one. We'll come back after this. I would like to describe myself as a creative. I like to write. I really like to read. I love to play video games. Growing up with Lindsay, having cerebral palsy, was um, growing up as it was with any younger sister, I'd say. I've always made sure that she was included in whatever I was doing. But there were always certain games that I was like, oh, I wish I could play this, but it's possible. I don't have the fine motor skills to be able to do it. I remember reading about Copilot Mode when Microsoft announced it. It's basically two controllers being used uh, for one input. The character on the screen could both be moved forward by player A and player B. I immediately hit on the fact that that was going to be something that me and Lindsay could do. The very first thing that I was able to do on Copilot was make a little stone house on Minecraft. I cried. I legitimately cried because I was finally free to experience all these video games that my brothers always talked about. Xbox was the only place Lindsay could have had that experience. When uh, the Reddit post happened, I was overwhelmed. I was expecting it to be, you know, slightly popular, but no, it got thousands of upvotes. If I had gotten one person to learn about Copilot and, and use it in their family, and have a similar impact, then this was worth it. Everyone, regardless of their experience, has something to bring to the table. My dream for the future is a future where things like Copilot, it isn't big news. Amazing, right? Mm -hmm. I like the last line uh, as well. It, it's um, close to the, our point of view about kind of being already existing in the future where these things aren't supposed to be big news anymore um but yeah no. it's um it's a cool feature i was thinking maybe we should try some uh some co-pilot rocket league back when um, <laughs> allow us but i could carry i could carry you you know you're not too big to get on the shoulders mate we could we could um go for a few wins oh i i would love to co-pilot rocket league with you simon i i, I think that would be amazing Rocket Rocket League is actually one of those examples where I, I would have some difficulty because you really got to get into the shoulder buttons. But hey, guys, that 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 was my coverage, my my story for today. Xbox. Just wanted to give a big shout out. I do actually own an Xbox. I own a PlayStation Four as well. But this story in particular makes me lean much much more into Xbox. What I was just gonna say is. That's exactly right, but I also wonder what is this going to do for for the next generation of consoles um, on other platforms? Are they going to take take lead from this and take note of what um, Microsoft has, has done for the Xbox? But pretty amazing. They're yep. the first to do it. So great, thanks. Simon, I just wanted to check in with you. I'm mindful we haven't had a story from you yet. Are you all right for time, or how are we going? I mean, I think that t today's been a pretty awesome live stream as it is, and I, cool. I don't really want to drag us out just with um, my articles. <laughs> and um, It was only kind of just a bit of a recap on a story that's um, that broke a few weeks ago, so we can um, we can touch back in next week and get the latest. Because, Carry um, over. It's, yeah, it's uh, it's supposed to it's supposed to um, continue to to get worse each week, so we can <laughs> catch up. You see what's new there, but no, I, I think it's been a pretty pretty fun stream, and it's a good place to wrap things up, I reckon. Cool. So, um, just in final thoughts, you know, I was really really amped about being able to bring the the Microsoft story. I mean, I I've learned a lot about mental health as well mm. 
you, you know, it's not often you see the sharing of thoughts and ideas around mental health, Simon, and, and I think it is a Kiwi sort of perspective to mental health problem but i don't think it's limited to uh new zealand either hmm. it's not it's 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 in different stages in different parts of the world and i think new zealand is probably just one of the better reported countries <laughs> on, on those sort of stats but you know uh, i saw an image the other day from uh well from yesterday actually and you know we're floating it almost around two suicides a day for the year like if you put it in those kind of terms it it's not good it's that's two families that's two husbands and wives every day Mm. um but i guess i'll just for my final thoughts um just on my own personal experience if you ever feel like you might benefit from talking to somebody professionally you 100% will you might not benefit from the first person you talk to or the second person you talk to but there'll be someone out there who will be able to relate and understand and, and, and be able to give you great advice and support while you work through your own um, issues or your own um, you know past that you that you want to, to reconcile um, for me, what worked is I actually found a drug counsellor. I mean, I wasn't going to him, you know, because I had a drug problem that was ruining my life. But I just knew that a drug counsellor would be able to relate to my points of view and have similar life experiences to lean on. And it worked a treat. We didn't talk about, you know, we, went, we actually spent most of the time talking about me and my life and... and, and and it, it was it was never real about the drugs, but because of his background, it allowed him to do just the normal job of being a therapist really well. So I just wanted to, to use that as an example that, you know, you might not like the first person because I didn't. I went through the, the, the automatic, the, the sorry, the free channels you get through work, you know, the, 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 the support you can get through there. And they sucked. They were <laughs> shit. They made it worse, and but I was just I was confident enough that I knew I could, I could find a way to to, to make myself feel better, and it wasn't with with them. So, um, find somebody if you think you're going to benefit from it. You will. You just need to find the right person, and there's somewhere out there. Awesome, awesome advice, uh, Simon. Hannah, any final thoughts? Just thanks for today, guys. It's been great. Uh... And thanks so much for your story today, Jade. I've got to say, I had a similar story to say about accessibility, and I just find more organisations and platforms are thinking about accessibility, which is really exciting in 2021. It's long overdue, but thank you. And and just finally from me, I I always forget to do this every, every stream, but if you like the content, if you feel like supporting, uh, one one really cool way is just uh, to follow me on all platforms. Uh, you'll find those links in the chat by hitting exclamation mark social. It doesn't cost you anything, but for those of you uh, where your wallet might, might be burning a hole in your pocket, you could always uh, consider subscribing as well. Everything that you... Uh, donate will be reinvested into providing you a better quality stream and just a shout out to Simon's very HD webcam. How, you still finding that okay, Simon? Oh, <laughs> shout out to it, to it. Not trying to focus on this beautiful mug every ten seconds. <laughs> it's nice to be in picture. Um, yeah. And shout out to Anarchist for being in the chat. Um, the comment from earlier about he's got to give some love to Burnout. Great game, but just not mm. as iconic as Wipeout. Um, and he <laughs> said it was great. Great to hear you guys. Good to have yeah. you in the chat, mate. Good to have you here, Anarchist. But, but that'll do for now. So thank you for being a part of the channel. Thank you for being a part of the journey. Please stay awesome. And Simon? We'll see you all in the next one. Bam. <laughs>